Oh, no, it's that was fast. It says we're streaming. Can you <laughs> see that on your end? I can see that we're streaming live on Facebook. Okay, sweet. Well, welcome to the Ask Lindsay Anything show. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we got a bunch of questions ahead of time because people can't always tune in on a weekday at noon, but so I'll just kind of like jump into those and then we can just have our own chat and I'll end up asking you questions because I always think it's interesting to ask questions too. But uh, actually, before we even do any of that, you're one of the rare people that I haven't had on my show before. Like I have a YouTube channel with lots of guest interviews and I had it just never worked out that I got you lined up yet, which we'll have to do. But because of that, uh, can you give us a little rundown of who you are and what you do and all those things before we just jump into all these questions? Yeah, so I'm Lindsay Bugby and I run the Postman's Knock, which is a blog um, that really just focuses on art in general, tons of tutorials. And I think what it's very best known for is calligraphy. And, you know, it's it's calligraphy instruction because I mean, I've been doing it since 2014 and honestly, like, <clears throat> I, and I'm not sure this is a bodacious claim to make or not, but I think we were the first ones to do a printable pointed pen worksheets um, because that was back in 2014. And of course, since then, um, you know, a lot of others have popped up, but I, yeah, I just, I still love calligraphy and blogging about it and blogging about sketchbooking, watercolor, just anything related to art. So, yeah. I remember your worksheets from when I was first getting started. So yeah, I do think that like, you know, when I, when I started learning calligraphy and I started Googling it, yours was always the first one to come up. Like your blog is insanely popular for calligraphy. It's impressive. Yeah. And it's, you know, the worksheets actually came about because, um, my husband is from Peru. So obviously that's where he went to school. And he said, Hey, you know, when we were kids and we were learning how to write cursive, we had this workbook called Coquito. And I think maybe if you did that with calligraphy, people would like it. And I was like, that is like the dumbest idea I've ever heard. <laughs> you know, like Nobody's going to print this out and do it. And he's like, no, no, but I think you should just try, like, give it a try. That's always how our conversations go. He has an idea of like, yeah, that's dumb, but then I try it and it really works. So yeah, that, that was how that got started. So really it's like maybe a lot of calligraphy worksheets can be traced back to, you know, this, this workbook in Peru. Uh, no pun intended, traced back, literally traced. <laughs> traced. <laughs> um, does your husband work with you? He has for years and years. So he has a PhD in aerospace engineering, like super, super smart dude. Um, so he's the one that did, you know, my website and yeah, we worked together for a long time, but then about like four months ago, he was just like, yeah, this isn't challenging. I mean, because he was like answering calligraphy customer service emails, which he is way overqualified to do. So now he works at a national lab out of California. Um, so he is like, I don't know, doing materials optimization. So if you get on an airplane, he has, you know, perhaps designed the component that makes the airplane light and a little bit different than answering calligraphy questions. <laughs> like just a little bit. It was <laughs> yeah. um that's, it's just so interesting to me. Like when I talk to people who have worked with their, their spouse, that's just like a whole other topic that I feel like we could talk about, but, uh, I will ask you questions that people submitted first before I selfishly ask you the questions that I'm curious about. So, um, actually the first one submitted was from Mindy. How long from when you began to learn calligraphy until you established your business as a full-time job? Give us the like history of learning it and then turning it into a job, I guess, is the question. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, it worked differently than a lot of people because I started learning calligraphy-ish in 2012. So there weren't really any resources out there for learning. And, you know, there was, there were no social media accounts saying, hey, you can do this as a living. Honestly, I got the idea because I was fresh out of college. And I was working at, as an office manager at 
a software company and I just really didn't like, you know, that kind of work. I was like, man, I, I feel like I could be doing my own thing. So one day a coworker mentioned that sometimes she'll write like calligraphy on wedding invitations on envelopes for money. And I was like, people will pay you to do that. <laughs> and she's like, oh yeah. And so then I'm like, oh, okay. And that was really what sparked it where I was like, oh, well, I guess maybe I could write on wedding invitation envelopes for money. Um, and then I would see calligraphy online, but I didn't really, you know, understand how to learn it because I, I just couldn't find anything. I think in 2014, Molly Superthorpe put out her book. So that, you know, was really helpful. But for me, it was just like a lot, a lot of trial and error which I think is why the learning materials on TPK do tend to be, you know, rather detailed because for me, it's like I encountered every single roadblock and sort of figured out how to, how to get through that. Um, so I'd say from when I began, which was with faux calligraphy, I was terrified of the dip pen to when, you know, I actually started my business. When I started my business, I wasn't proficient at dip pen calligraphy. I actually sold faux calligraphy stuff in 2013 because I just couldn't, you know, I, I just wasn't confident with the dip pen. So I guess it, it took me a couple of years, but I would say if somebody's starting out, you know, in this day and age, there are so many resources online. It's like, yeah, you could probably learn how to do it well in three months. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So that's how you learned. And then how did the business turn? How did it turn into a business that was, I mean, you said you started writing on, on envelopes and stuff, but how quickly was that after you learned? And then how did it turn into the postman's knock? Well, I started an Etsy shop before I quit my job as an office manager. Um, and, you know, I was just selling like faux calligraphy place cards, invitation design. I taught myself Photoshop. Um, but I mean, it wasn't a profitable business for probably three years, but you know, the nice thing was my husband and I had both gone to university on full ride scholarships. I mean, I don't know how it is in Canada, but in the U S you know, you're usually saddled down with a lot of debt after you get out of college. So we were really lucky because we didn't have any debt and he was, um, uh, graduate student at CU so I was and and we didn't have kids or anything and we lived in a studio apartment so really you know no expenses um so yeah the the business just didn't generate much from 2012 2013 in 2014 it really started to pick up and I think that's because I became serious about the blog so I was blogging about calligraphy and, you know, just putting out learning resources. And I think that's when it, you know, became profitable and really evolved into what, what people know it as today. Mm -hmm. um, that brings me to one, someone else submitted an interesting question that like, I'm curious about, because I feel like even though you and I both teach calligraphy and both have similar businesses I think people would like see that way I think they're also very different in that like you focus on your blog and you focus on your email list and I focus on YouTube and Instagram and it's like very a very very different model um, but on the surface people see it and it's like kind of the same thing if somebody didn't really know and so someone was asking um like, what is a, what is a typical day in your life look like? And I'm curious to see how different that is from mine. Yeah. I mean, I think you know, obviously you and I have talked personally a couple of times about social media and, you know, how just, yeah, I, you are killing it in a way that like makes me feel overwhelmed. Cause I'm like, how is she you know, doing this? Yeah. But um, I feel that way about your blog. Like I can't, I can't, I can't do that. You know, I think if you objectively look at both of us, like you have this innate talent for getting people together and getting people really excited about things. And for me, like my talent is writing like actual, you know, language. And then, you know, the aesthetics like calligraphy and sketchbooking. 
And for me, um, you know, I have an English degree. And when I was at university, what I trained in was blogging. So I worked for, uh, or I interned for a magazine called Mother Earth News. It's like this, um, you know, grassroots off the grid sort of deal, but they were, they really like wanted their interns to blog to up the SEO of the website. And so I guess that to me was like an enjoyable way to increase my visibility. And I think that's the way that I communicate best because you're so good verbally, you know, like you're, you're making stories of yourself, like saying things and doing things. And I'm like, okay, I got to put on makeup to do that. <laughs> you know, gotta, and, 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 I mean, that's my first roadblock and that's where it ends. Yeah. That part um, sucks. I won't lie. <laughs> yeah, that part's like the worst. And so for me, it's just a lot easier to communicate through, you know, photos and paragraphs. And I think I, it, it's something that concerns me because it's like people sometimes will question whether blogging is dead or not. You know, do people even still enjoy reading blogs? Um, and I mean, I do, but I definitely tend towards more Luddite um, tendencies. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah I think but- um, I actually had somebody the other day uh, because I have like for, with all my YouTube videos, I have an accompanying blog post and it's nowhere near as in depth as yours. And like the, the pictures on it are just screenshots from the YouTube video. Like I don't, I don't just spend much time on the blog part, but, um, I had somebody the other day say that they were very happy that there was a written version of it because they're just overwhelmed by the amount of video there is these days. And like, I get that there's so much, like, especially with TikTok and now Instagram is focusing on reels and like all the video stuff is absolutely like everywhere and exhausting. And so I think the pendulum swung really far in one direction and it's bound to like writing has been around forever. That's like, that's, you know, what humans are used to. And so I think it'll swing back and like, right. people will always fall back on writing. So I don't, yeah, it's interesting. I hope, so. I hope it'll reach this happy medium because for me, like, I don't mind making videos once in a while, but I mean, like the video editing can just be, you know, kind of stressful and, um, yeah, but you asked me about a typical day. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I I wake up at around like 6.30 and go on like a run or go, you know, lift for an hour or whatever. That's like my workout time is in the morning. And then we take our kid to daycare at nine because um, it, it's just impossible to get anything done, you know, when you have a small kid around. And I think that, you know, it looks like, this type of thing what we do it would be like so easy to but I mean you even posted the other day trying to get work done with your cat and it's like yeah so yeah I can't imagine with a kid oh especially this one (laughs) yeah he's gone for the day which is great because you know that gives me time to reset and do stuff in the mornings I answer emails I'm sure you get a lot of emails um I do too and I you know, spend like an hour, hour and a half sort of sifting through those. Um, And then, yeah, mostly it's photography and blogging for like three days out of the week. And then the other two days of the week, I'll work on a project. So like, you know, making a video course or making a worksheet. Um, And usually that's just kind of how my week shakes out. And then I try When I didn't have kids, I worked all day, like until 10 p.m. Now I'm pretty much done at like, you know, five when Remy gets home and then I go to bed at like 10. Yeah, someone else asked um, how how your business has changed and how your creative practice has changed since you've had your kid. Yeah, well, I mean, right after he was born, I was like, this is, I just, this is not sustainable. I mean, he was so, he was a bad baby. And I say that because like, he's a great toddler. He's really, really (laughs) cute. You'd fall in love with him if you could interact with him. But yeah, he was like a horrible infant and it just cried all the time. And I'm just like, I really just want to sit down at my desk and have it be quiet and work on stuff. And, you know, it's, um, 
I think like once we got into a groove and once we were like, all right, you know what, we're going to do daycare, which was hard for us because we both come from families where it's like, if you can stay at home with your kid, you should. But you know, it's like, we just had him watching YouTube all the time. And so, yeah, I, I think that having a kid was actually really good for me in the long run because it gave me a routine because I, I don't have any stopping points if I, if I'm not given stopping points. I mean, I will literally work from the time I wake up to the time I go to sleep. So it's actually been kind of refreshing to have weekends now because he's not in daycare. So it's like, okay, I'm going to spend time with my kid. Whereas before I felt like if I had free time, it needed to be devoted to, you know, building my business. So ultimately, I, I guess I'm glad that he's around. <laughs> and both, okay, so back to the the thing about not like having boundaries or not stopping yourself before. I feel like that's such an interesting topic for entrepreneurs because it's so common amongst everybody. I just started reading a book about burnout, in fact, like yesterday. Um, so like, was that because you felt like pressure to or because you just like got lost in it and absolutely loved doing it? I think it's just my personality type. My husband says I'm a robot because he's just like, how, how can you just like, I could just sit and work on something forever. And that's what my mom has always said since I was a little girl, just really easy that I would just self entertain. And it might've been because we grew up in rural Kansas. Um, so it's like our closest neighbor was a graveyard. There was nothing to do. And so I just had to figure out stuff to do, which I think actually went on to benefit the blog, you know, because every two days I'm like, Hey, here's a new project. And it's like, you know, going back to being bored in Western Kansas. Um, but yeah, I, I just, I really, really do love what I do. I don't like some parts of it, like, like the social media, to be honest, like that just isn't really my bag. I do love getting to interact with people, but, um, it, it can be a little hard sometimes to keep up with all of that. Mm -hmm. I feel you. It's speaking of when you were a kid, Pavlina asked, as a child, what did you want to be when you grew up? I found a little worksheet thing that I filled out. I said I wanted to be an artist. <laughs> really? <laughs> what I wanted to be. <laughs> so what, like growing up, did you do a lot of art and in, in school and stuff? Did you take art in, in classes and things like that? Or did you kind of like just teach yourself? No, I, I did take a lot of art classes. I mean, you have to remember this is like rural Kansas. So we didn't have like a ton of funding and stuff, but I did end up making a couple of pieces in high school that won national awards and like toured New York City. Um, so I always had, you know, a knack for it. And then when the time came for university, um, neither of my parents had gone to college. And, you know, my mom said, well, you can already do art. So why would you study art? And I'm like, oh yeah, that's good logic. So <laughs> I studied English instead. But you know, I, I think in the end, actually studying English worked out because essentially for, you know, all 13 years of my schooling, kindergarten through senior year of high school, I had the same art teacher. So I was basically doing an apprenticeship for like 13 years. And then, you know, took a break and did four years of studying literature. And now you have the TPK blog, which is this marriage of art. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I, yeah, it's just, I, I always like asking people that question about whether they did art classes in school, because I think you see a mix of people like me, for example, I never took art classes my whole life. In fact, I've told this story a few times now, but I had a friend uh, create some art for me to put in my portfolio to get into interior design an architecture school because I had to have some sort of creative stuff and everything I had was very technical and I didn't I didn't actually like art and I thought I was terrible at it <laughs> so I cheated on my portfolio to get into school um but then you then you hear people like you who had like it makes so much sense exactly where you came from the two things and so yeah it's always interesting to me to hear that uh yeah lots of questions about how you got started okay this is a, a technical question do you shake your ink jar before you use it? Mary says, uh, 
I only ask because my ink jar lid and opening get goopy and I have to switch jars after several uses to clean them so nothing falls into my ink and I think it's because I shake the containers. Yeah, no, I wouldn't shake it. I'd stir it with a chopstick. Because you chopstick. know, like, if you shake it and you take off the lid, that's going to be a mess anyway. And then, yeah, you run into that other problem where you're incorporating in all this gunk from the lid. Mm. You use your dip pen in so many creative ways. Where do you get your inspiration for that from? Yeah, I mean, that's just the Western Kansas, honestly. It's like, what am I going to do for fun today? Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I just am programmed to think of, you know, projects and different ways to use things. So that's, I, I guess I just think about it. I'm always on the lookout for styles and, you know, things that I like. Like if we go downtown, I'll see maybe a mural and I'll think, oh, you know, I like that Scandinavian style motif. Maybe I'll incorporate it into a card project or something like, and yeah, it's just, it's just years of, you know, having to entertain myself. Now I do live in a fun place, but that's kind of stuck. Well, like those tiles right behind you, I feel like those look like they were inspired by some tiles you probably saw somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. When we, um, when we went to Brazil, I saw a lot of tiles like that and I just, you know, wanted to do something cool with that piece of furniture. So we have this, which is a shelf. And then I also did a tile motif in our office. I feel so, like it's just like keeping your eyes open to things that catch your, like they, just because it's not calligraphy doesn't mean it can't relate to something that you want to incorporate, you know? Oh, absolutely. And I think the blog, you know, is, is really, really known for calligraphy, but that's because that's what people want. Really my strength has always been in illustration and, but that just isn't something that people focus on as much, I think, you know, um, and I think that you can vouch, you know, attest to this too, that people just really like knowing pretty ways to write things because you can already, you know, write. So why couldn't you write with a brush pen? Why couldn't you write with a dip pen? But as far as illustration goes, I mean, you're going, yeah, I can't, I'm not an artist, you know, I, and I think eventually you got there, but that's just something like a lot of people don't do. So, mm -hmm. so that would be why, you know, the focus is mostly on calligraphy. Do I love calligraphy? Yeah, I absolutely love calligraphy, but I love it just as much as I love drawing with pen and ink, you know, mm -hmm. using watercolor. I think that's, that was a big part of why I, um, for workshop week decided to bring together all different types of artists and all different types of projects instead of doing like a workshop week for calligraphy or a workshop week for lettering because I think it exposes people to things that they didn't know they could be inspired to try and like makes it so much clearer like that you don't have to be a pro at you know or you don't have to learn a ton about using a certain type of art um, tool you can just learn a quick little lesson from somebody and then incorporate so many different things into the thing you already love like take that watercolor you learned five minutes of and put it into your your calligraphy work and see how they work together and what you like and stuff so that was fun really um, mediums to make envelope art or yeah. a sketchbook i'm a huge proponent of you know sketchbooking so yeah yeah i totally agree yeah um speaking of workshop week uh jane asked as part of workshop week, were there other artists projects that you wanted to try? You know, I, you're gonna hate me. I didn't even look at the other ones. It's, I am so busy with my toddler and, um, I, yeah, I basically made the video for you and, uh, submitted it and, you know, had some back and forth with your assistant, Kelsey, mm -hmm. who was super nice. Um, but I, yeah, I just, I didn't even look and I should have, but I'm, I'm <laughs> not I, offended. I, I, but obviously it was like, it was the coolest. And I really loved the aspect of being able to chat while my video was broadcasting. And that is something that I would actually like to incorporate, you know, into TPK going forward. Cause it was mm -hmm. like, yeah, this is really nice for people to watch this and be like, Hey, what paper are you using or, you know, and because to me, like 
if I'm doing live calligraphy, I, I, how do you even do that? You know, you're, you're focusing on what you're writing. You're not going to be looking up every two seconds to answer questions. And if you do, then it ends up being really long and people tune out. But if, yeah, if you have the video playing and you can answer at the same time, it worked really well, which was like an unintended thing, because like you said, or like, you know, when I reached out to people to submit videos for it, I, there was no requirement that you had to come into the chat and do that. That was all just like the speakers out of the goodness of their heart coming and doing that. And people really appreciated it for sure. Well, it was fun. I liked it a lot. There's, there's a bunch of workshop week um, students in the chat right now. I recognize their names. <laughs> um, okay. What else? Um Someone said, I have a weird question. If you could change your name from the postman's knock to something else, what do you think it would be and why? Like, what words would you want to include? Oh, that's a really good question because that is something um, I regret making it so long. And my email address is very long. And if somebody, I feel like yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I know you can relate. And also, it's like if I'm talking to an unaffiliated, um, third party about the business, you know, like, like, I don't know, an accounting firm or whatever. I'm like, yes, the postman's knock, the postman's knock, like the mailman. So, I mean, but I don't know what I would call it. I haven't really thought about that because, because I'm not going to change the name at this point. I mean, the business is a decade old. I, and normally I just say TPK. And I think when people, you know, discover the postman's knock, that's usually how they refer to it too, is just, you know, TPK. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I don't know what it would be, but it would be something short yeah. and, you know, that just kind of encompasses. Um, but yeah, mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I feel you on the top, but for me, it's less of like, actually it, it's, it's always explaining the happy ever crafter because everybody wants to say, happily ever crafter or whatever happy ever happy ever after crafter I get that one a lot and um and then also talking to like professionals like accountants or lawyers or whatever they're like oh that's cute that's like, I know oh, I feel that's like, like oh. thanks yeah it's not hard work at all yeah and then it's like well what do you do and that, that's what's so funny about my husband and I is like when people meet us it's like what do you do? Well, he's a rocket scientist, but you know, only, only up until like three months ago, you know, until then he worked for me. So, yeah. like, you know, my company is what bought the house and, you know, whatever, but you know, it's like, yeah, I'm a blogger. He's a rocket scientist. And they're yeah. like, Oh, they're like, Oh, he's, he's smart. And you're just that it's, that's a cute blog project you have. Yeah. <laughs> so annoying. Yeah. So, okay. For, I'm curious then speaking of like the business side of things, what, how, how does like the income of TPK break down? Like how much of it is blog revenue and how much of it is like teaching materials and whatever else? Like, I'm just curious and percentage wise, like how that works for you. Well, we don't do any ads whatsoever on the blog. So yeah. everything would be teaching materials. So worksheets and e-courses. And then in 2019, we actually started selling um, tangible products. So, you know, like that calligraphy kit that we gave away mm -hmm. for workshop week, um, all sorts of calligraphy supplies. I'm actually working with uh, Simon of Scribblers right now, who is somebody you should talk to. He is so funny. He's a blast. Um, but we're working together. He's made an iron gall ink that I'm really, really excited to sell. So yeah, I, I have, you know, tangible products that ship and then educational products. Um, and then we do some affiliate links, but those aren't, um, you know, just, just here and there really. So. Yeah. Obviously. So the not having ads on the blog is like a very intentional choice, right? Like, did you, have you ever debated it? Because I mean, I feel like your readership is so huge that you could make a lot of money off of that. And I think it's interesting for people to understand like that that's an intentional choice that you're not doing that for their benefit, you know? I guess I just never even thought about it because I seriously, I get so annoyed when, you know, I pick up my phone to look at a recipe and it's like, I have to go through so many, uh, lose weight in 10 days, you know, do you want to, or whatever 
I've even been looking at recently, you know, you want to buy furniture stain and it's like, I just, I just want to know how to make this salmon. Um, (laughs) so, so, I mean, I get so annoyed and I'm just like the blog already makes, you know, enough income for sure. I don't, I don't want to do that to people. I feel like it's a major turnoff. And I think that people understand that, you know, if they buy products from us, they're supporting us. Um, so I don't need to like, you know, bring in third party ads to do that. If it was a different type of blog where it was harder to, you know, tie the content into, you know, other things like educational materials, maybe I would consider ads, but I just feel like TPK is a pretty specific, you know, type of place where I don't want to put in those kinds of distractions. I, I think it's also such a rabbit hole and I want people to feel like, you know, they're reading this awesome book or something. And you just, yeah. I think ads really take away from that. Yeah, I agree. I think also like, it's kind of like the chicken and the egg issue in a way where if you had started with ads on the site, you probably wouldn't have gained the readership that you did because it would have been annoying for people and people would have tuned out. Whereas now, now you have such a big readership that for some people it might have it might be tempting to add ads because you're like, oh, I could probably make a lot of money off of this. But if you do that, then you're like kind of punching the people in the face who've been following you forever and being like trying to capitalize on them, which feels gross. And it's really interesting because on last week's episode, um, uh, we were talking, Shada and I, about like whether or not you should um, try and have content that gets new people in with keywords and whatever versus having content that serves the people that are already there and how this way feels a lot more genuine and a lot more like what you want to do because it feels icky to do all the like scammy marketing things just to get new people in just to make more money where if you actually serve the people who are there it ends up paying you back a million times more and it feels a lot more genuine and you feel just like a lot happier about you know actually connecting with the people that you're trying to serve um which is just so interesting to me that it's coming up again because it's really kind of the same the same answer yeah I I mean for me it's just always kind of been the same routine I just kind of think of you know projects I want to do or products I want to make and then I make the product or the project and blog about it and I feel like it serves you know the people that are already there And then I also get people that, you know, are really enthusiastic um, to find Mm -hmm. it. But mostly people find us actually through looking for handwriting tips and Mm -hmm. watercolor. And then, isn't that weird? Yeah. Yeah. So I get my Google Analytics and like a lot of people do come to us for calligraphy, but actually now your beginner's guide to calligraphy is ranked, I think, a couple above ours, which is really interesting because these are two like completely separate articles, right? Like, because you're talking about brush pen, I'm talking about pointed pen, Google doesn't differentiate because if you're just starting, you don't know to differentiate. Yeah, people don't know to type in how to use brush pen calligraphy versus how to do pointed pen calligraphy. They just type in how to do calligraphy in general. Right, Mm -hmm. Right. so I think like you come up first because brush pen is more popular. It's it's more approachable, frankly. Um, So because of that, like people still end up sticking around for the calligraphy stuff, but mostly how they find us is the watercolor and then handwriting. Um, so weird, like, no. so weird. Um, I think the handwriting thing is an interesting conversation too, because I get that, I get that all the time. Everybody always says like, okay, I understand like, you know, the fancy calligraphy stuff, but can you just teach a workshop on handwriting? And I was like, I don't really have any like authority on any of that. I just, I'm, my handwriting's not very good. I don't know that I would like teach you that, you know? Yeah, class for it constantly. I have debated about that because it's like, you know, handwriting is supposed to be such a part of your personality. And so for a long time, I was like, I don't think there should be any instruction on this because like, who am I to tell you, this is what you need to project to the world as far as, you know, whatever. 
But then recently I'm like, you know, stuff like the Palmer method exists. So whatever, I'm going to make like a handwriting course over how to make beautiful, like vintage cursive, Mm -hmm. if you want to make it for certain occasions. So we'll see how that goes. Um, I've just been working on that on and off. I, uh, funny story about the handwriting thing. When I first started teaching calligraphy, I used to teach it at my dining room table and like workshops and people would come. And, um, this guy reached out one time and he just sent an email. And first of all, it was very rare that a man would reach out. It's usually women who come to these workshops. And so I got this email from this man who basically was just asking, he's like, I see you have calligraphy workshops. Like, I just, I just need to improve my handwriting like wondering if you do one-on-one handwriting lessons. And I was kind of like, A, I don't do handwriting lessons. B, I don't do one-on-one lessons. And C, if, I don't know, it just felt a little like, it felt a little, the way it was worded, it just felt a little iffy. And I was like, I don't think I want to do a one-on-one handwriting lesson with this man. Mm-hmm. And even Ryan was like, absolutely not. You're not going to like meet this man and do this one-on-one lesson with him. It sounds weird. So I said to him, I said, I don't teach handwriting, but I have an upcoming calligraphy workshop and like just doing calligraphy will get you to slow down enough to pay attention to your writing a little bit more or whatever. Um, So so he ended up signing up, which I thought was really interesting. And then um, leading up to it, I kept thinking like, I don't know what to expect when this guy shows up, you know, like I, I really had no idea what to expect. And I was picturing sort of, I don't know why I had this image in my head of like this, this like nerdy kind of like quiet um introverted type of guy and he showed up at the door and he was like this like six foot five beautiful built man and he was a doctor and he had bad handwriting because he was a doctor and I was like oh my god and then he sits down at the table and it was like a group of young like probably 25 year old girls who all came for like a girls night and then there's this like beautiful hot doctor sitting at the table with them and they're all like kicking each other under the table being like who is this guy (laughs) It was such a funny, like such a funny image. It was just one of my favorite stories to tell about workshops. <laughs> yeah, you never know what to expect with people there. I, no. It can be interesting. And it's funny because at the beginning of every workshop, Jess of Greenleaf and Blueberry and I have talked about this because we switch off. She teaches uh, watercolor workshops here. And then like in the afternoon, I'll teach a calligraphy workshop or vice versa. And we always talk about how you get the dynamics of the group at the very beginning. You know, who's going to be the vocal one that's asking questions, who's going to be the one that's really quiet, but like, you know, totally has everything down. You don't even have to do anything, which those are the worst because sometimes people will take my workshops and they've already taken like the online beginners workshop and they're so good at it. And you feel like you feel like you want to give them extra because they've spent money to be there and they already know what they're doing kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Or then I find I also have the people who uh, sit there like stone faced the whole time and it really seems like they're not having a good time. But then a couple days later, when I send out like a feedback survey, they're like, that was so amazing. I love that so much. And I was just like, okay, so you're just shy. Like you just want to, like the whole time I thought you weren't enjoying it. And now, okay, great. I'm glad you liked it. But my God, it's hard. <laughs> no, it, it can be. And I'm sure, you know, for me, it took a lot to work up to workshops because I used to like get hives if I had to speak in public and, you know, like my voice would shake. And so people, you know, were starting to ask me to do them like back in 2015. And I'm like, I don't don't think so. But now it's just like, yeah, they they are really fun. I really do, you know, enjoy getting to do them and meet people. The logistics part of it is a little sucky. Like, you know, I always say no refunds just because I want to, you know, like streamline everything, but invariably a couple of weeks before somebody will say, Hey, I I broke my wrist or whatever. And I'm like, well, I don't want to be a jerk, you know? Okay. So that part of it is a little like tough to, you know, manage like who's coming and who need, who has this specific question and whatever, but yeah, the, the setup and takedown and like all the time beforehand to prep the kits and everything is so much more work than people realize. Not to mention just like the energy. I feel like at the end of a workshop, I am spent, like I don't really do much the next day because I just put like so much energy into the whole thing and I'm exhausted the next day. And Oh yeah, because you have to be on your, you have to be, you know, megawatt basically. Mm-hmm. Like, and, it, and it is really, um, 
enthralling, you know, to be around their energy, like you're excited, they're excited. But yeah, at the end, you're like, wow, that was intense. (laughs) I remember after the first few, like I would just, I had this um, routine where I'd finish the workshop, I'd pack everything into my car and I would just sit down and sit in the car for like 20 minutes and just sit there or like I I would maybe sometimes drive all the way home and then park in the driveway and just like I just didn't even have enough energy to get out of the car and go inside and just sit there for a little while (laughs) yeah it's tough to be on like that it is and I I think it doesn't you know come across that way but that's yeah that's why and you know for TPK it's like workshops are negligible like I could either do them or not because it's not it's never been like a huge uh, part of the business but I do like to do them. So I hope that, you know, it works out for next year. I think this year people are still a little iffy about like, mm-hmm. you know, travel and meeting up and stuff. And, you know, that that's fine. And so we'll see. Yeah. It's been weird not having any, but at the same time, a little bit like helpful with the energy side of things for sure. <laughs> well, I think for me, it was like, I was used to not doing them because, you know, I was, I, I was pregnant and then I had my kid. And then he was like a tornado. So I didn't do workshops for like, you know, three years then. And then Jess and I did um, two years ago. Last year we couldn't because of COVID. So yeah, it's, it's been a while, but I'm excited for when we can again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Okay. I'm going to see if I can share my screen because someone asked a question that I think is interesting. Mary asked, what's the difference between these inks? That just seems like they're all Sumi ink. Yeah, they are all Sumi ink. It would have to be like, you would have to look at the descriptions of them. The one I sell is the one on the right with the red cap, the Yasutomo. And it's a vegan ink. Um, It's not completely waterproof. I don't know the brand of the one in the middle. The one on the left obviously is Kuratake. So maybe maybe that is waterproof. Um, But yeah, I, I don't know the difference between those three. They would probably all just you know, have a nice velvety texture. I, I would guess that they're not completely, completely waterproof because most Sumi inks aren't. So that's, um, what's your favorite ink to use? Um, probably actually that iron gall that Simon from Scribblers just made. Like it is, it is really, really cool. <laughs> it's so what's the difference between that and like a, a Sumi ink? So iron gall is made from galls from like trees, which are made by wasps in this weird way. So it's a really natural ink and it's something that the Vikings use. So I don't know if you've, you know, gone to a museum and you've seen like a manuscript that has some holes um, in it, but that's actually this iron gall ink, like eating through the paper after centuries and centuries. But the reason it's so cool is because like Sumi is pretty thick, which makes it good for beginners because you can, you know, really hone in on like your stroke width. Sumi ink, when you use it, like the upstrokes are super thin and they start off being like almost invisible. So you don't, you can like barely see them. But the cool thing is as it dries, And we're talking like immediately plus hours later, it just gets darker and darker and darker and darker. So it like, it's just like this perfect watery texture, not great for beginners because I, watery inks aren't awesome for beginners, but um, yeah, I just, I think it's so cool that and the historical aspect, you know, just thinking that you're using something that has been used for centuries. Hmm. So yeah, I love it. So in your kit, there's Sumi ink. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, someone had, okay, someone put a picture of your kit. I'm just going to pull it up on screen because it's awesome. Um, so Sumi ink, and then what nibs do you have in there? I do the Nico G and the Browse Extra Fine 66. And the reason I do that is because the Nico G is, it's like a really good nib to, you know, get out all of your beginner mistakes on. So you're not going to break this thing, right? Like it's, you can use it for the downstrokes, for the upstrokes, you can exert pressure incorrectly. It would just take a lot to damage that nib. The Browse Extra Fine 66, on the other hand, it's much more delicate, but the idea is that you use the Nico G first 
And then after you get the hang of that and you understand the basics, you move on to the extra fine 66, which is much more flexible. Mm -hmm. And then uh, a, that's a jar for putting the ink in or yeah. Yep. And then two holders. Yeah. So you have your straight holder, which you start off with. So you can use the Nico G or the extra fine 66 with that. The straight holder is actually going to be the more difficult of the two to use. Um, but that is a really hard sell for people. I mean, like, because objectively, if you know nothing about calligraphy and I hold up the two pens and I say, which one is going to be easier, you're always going to pick the straight one, you know? Yeah. But um, the oblique is actually really, really nice, especially for right-handed people. And that fits the Nico G nib. So like if you are teaching a calligraphy workshop in real life, you would try and get people to use an oblique right away? No, I have them use the straight pen first and I'm like, see how hard this is? Okay, now let's move on to the oblique. And people are like, whoa, <laughs> you know, like, I thought yeah. this was gonna be so tough. Um, so yeah, I have them use the straight pen first and kind of, you know, then they have something to compare right. the oblique pen to. Yeah. Okay, and then the other two things in this kit, what are these? So that that you have your cursor on, that's an art water cup. So just mm. for fun, you know. And then um, on the bottom left is a cleaning cloth. So if you open it, it has like this fun little quote on it and art. And then there's also a workbook that mm. comes with it. And I just redesigned that kit. So the workbook corresponds with our beginner course, which is really cool because you can choose to just use the kit like without any instruction but really like you're going to get the most out of the video course and the video course is 30 bucks so it's like kind of a no-brainer mm -hmm. okay tell people where they can find all of these things because we didn't even say that first <laughs> yeah so you're going to go to my ridiculously long website name the postman's knock the postman's knock.com um, and just a forewarning, yeah, it's a huge, huge rabbit hole. Like if you go to the blog, you will spend hours and hours because there are like six or 700 articles, tons of tutorials, lots and lots of inspiration. I would definitely, you know, have your Pinterest board ready and yeah. yeah. Um, so if they go there, they'll find the kit really easily. They'll find the kit under supplies. So we have, you know, tabs that or whatever, a menu that you can click on. So catalog is digital products. So things that you can, you know, print or eBooks and then supplies is supplies. So yeah, that's where you'll find the kit. Love it. Okay. I have one final question that just like, I just thought of it when we were looking at your kit and then we'll call it a day. What is your preferred method of cleaning nibs when you first get them? I like to stick them in a potato. Okay. I mean, to me, it's like not as dangerous as um, the fire, plus fire makes it brittle. Um, toothpaste never works for me. Maybe I just don't use the right one. I know Joe Vitolo reads the TPK blog and he's, um, you know, crazy, like really, really good at calligraphy. He's like traditional calligraphy and he's also a dentist. So he uses toothpaste. But for me, the potato always works. If I'm just feeling lazy and won't go and get the potato, I do just stick them in my mouth for a little Yes, I was going to ask about that. Okay. Because <laughs> it's like, I, why not? But I don't officially recommend that because <laughs> I'm always like, what if somebody like breathes one in? And that was my advice. So yeah, I feel like the potato method is definitely like the safest. Yeah, I am. Um the one again one of the first workshops I ever taught actually okay another workshop story and then I promise we'll end this but the first the very first workshop I ever taught I was pretty like I was I was pretty new at calligraphy and I was terrified to teach this first workshop and who signs up but the president of the Ottawa Calligraphy Society who's been doing calligraphy for like 30 years uh but he didn't ever do modern calligraphy he was very traditional so he wanted to learn modern calligraphy and he was very very nice but you can imagine the like terror when I realized this guy was coming to my first ever workshop and um I remember like I was showing everybody how to clean their nibs and he just like oh or you could just like and he pops it in his mouth and I was like what, <laughs> what? <laughs> like, 
okay. And everybody looked at him like he was crazy, but now that's like, that's my go-to method because it's so much faster. I just, yeah, like you said, I don't, I wouldn't like super recommend it because of, you know, maybe it's not great to be sucking like oils off of a steel nib, but that is what it is. <laughs> it's probably no worse than eating Cheetos, right? Like, <laughs> I know. I don't have any qualms with it. I just remember reading a, you know, something somewhere about a lady who uh, accidentally inhaled a needle, like she was a seamstress. Uh -huh. And, you know, usually it just passes through and you're fine, but hers ended up in her lung. So I'm like, and, and it was like big, big problems. So oh I just God. think about that with calligraphy nibs and I'm like, you know, yeah, officially I'm going to recommend the potato. Plus I think I mentioned, you know, using the mouth method once on the blog and a couple of people uh, didn't just didn't receive it very well. And I'm like, you know, I don't have to mention this. So I'm just not going to yeah. because yeah, just stick it in a potato. You know? yeah. yeah. But now people know, people know the <laughs> truth now. Truth comes out in this video. Well, only if you watch this video. Yeah. That's why it's called the ask me anything series. Okay. Lindsay, thank you so much for coming on. Um, I linked to your blog in the comments so people can go and I'm sure you'll have some people wanting that kit because why wouldn't you? It's amazing. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, is that, that's obviously the best place for people to find you then. Right. That's, that's really what we need to tell people to do. Definitely, definitely. Um, I mean, I, I do have Instagram. It's if you're familiar with Becca's Instagram, it's it's gonna be nothing like that. Like, I mean, I, I post a photo every day and maybe say something and I try to keep up on stories. But um yeah, if you want to get a hold of me, email is definitely best. Um, and then the blog is just that's really where you're going to see the postman's knock shining and you know all of our content and its glory awesome okay well it was lovely chatting with you everybody's saying thanks for taking the time to answer the questions and loved it as per usual they said so i'll talk to you soon all right bye becca bye